Hi, <clears throat> good evening to this lovely new hangout on this wonderful Friday evening. <clears throat> I'm your host, Gina Holske, and I, uh, yeah, I will be talking today about Octoprint, what has been happening the past couple of weeks there, what I will be tackling next, and we'll also have a, a short Q&A segment as we usually do in these kind of things. Um, <clears throat> I have to apologize, I will probably do this a couple of times because for some reason my throat started hurting something like an hour before uh, this um, hangout. So yeah, perfect timing as usual, I guess. So just apologies in advance for the <coughs> somewhat noisy coughing sounds or no, not coughing, coughing, but you know what I mean. Yeah, um, as always, uh, for those of you watching this live, we of course have a live chat here on YouTube uh, on the right, right, <laughs> um, uh, um, on, on, on desktop and below on mobile. And uh, I'll keep an eye on that. I have this over there, uh, the screen. And um, if there are any questions or something uh, you want to add to anything that I say or so, feel free to just uh, type it down there and then I'll hopefully be able to catch it and react to it. Okay, <clears throat> so Let's just uh, start right away with uh, what I have been up to the past couple of weeks. Um, first of all, directly after our last uh, Octoprint on Air episode, I took a really, really well needed vacation and spent some very sunny and calm days for, uh, in, in the southern Black Forest. I've been going there for a couple of years now, occasionally every other year or so. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's, uh, I really love that place. The internet reception isn't the best, but the view is, so um, yeah, it was really pretty much perfect. Yeah, um, and b basically right after I got back from that, uh, Thomas Sandlader came by and uh, did a short interview with me, which actually just went live yesterday. And I'll also put a link to that in the description uh, of this recording here. Um, you might have already seen it, but just in case you haven't, I also talk about uh, the history of Octoprint and, and how it all came to be and uh, yeah, and all, 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 uh, all, of, all of that stuff in there. So it might be interesting for you if you're interested in these kind of things. And uh, <clears throat> the week after the interview, I went to uh, the PyCon uh, Germany in Karlsruhe. I didn't meet any uh, of you. Uh, Octoprint users uh, right at the event, at least no one approached me, but at least I managed to meet someone on the evening before the event started. Um, overall, the conference was not entirely what I had hoped it would be. It was very data science heavy. So for those of you who don't know that the Python language is one of the fastest growing uh, programming languages right now, mostly thanks due to data science, so big data and, and, and uh, machine learning and all that. Um, and uh, yeah, so lots of the talks were about topics that I had no idea about at all. They were still interesting. I just had hoped for a bit more nitty gritty Python coding kind of talks. <laughs> but yeah, I still will give it another visit in 2019, I think, um, which is when, it, uh, so next year it will take place in Berlin. And I also will try to get a talk in about, yeah, driving 3D printers with Python. Um, or something like that, because yeah, a lot of people signaled uh, me that I talked to about what I do and all that, that this would probably be something that a lot of people would be interested in. So if you happen to be, uh, or happen to, happen to plan to be at PyCon next year, you might get a chance at least meeting me. I don't know, of course, if my talk will get accepted and I haven't even yet fully planned it through yet. So yeah, there's still a lot of time until uh, the call for uh, call for uh, participation even starts. So yeah, we'll see. Okay, so the, the, these were all the not very octoprint heavy things that I uh, did the last couple of weeks, but I of course also did a lot of coding work again. Um, you might have noticed that I pushed out 1.3.10 RC1 and 2. So the, the first release candidate for that new maintenance release went out on November 6th and the second one just now on Monday right? No, Tuesday, uh, November 13th. And um, <clears throat> sorry, really sorry. And um, yeah, I, I before I pushed them out, I, I still ironed out a couple of issues that I think I also had mentioned in the last uh, Octoprint on Air that I still wanted to do that. And then I pushed them out. And so far, the feedback has overall been quite positive. 
there were still some uh, bugs in the first release candidate that I was able to uh, fix in, in, the, in the second one. And in the second one, I already got some reports about some wording issues here and there that I now fixed. And um, also a bug in the new client IP check that I fixed. Um, there's still some issue now that I'm currently investigating um, with certain third party plugins. I'm not completely sure yet what the problem exactly is, but I'm sure I will get to the bottom of that as well. Uh, just in time for RC3. Um, yeah, and there's uh, one problem that three or four people reported and why I did this, I will get to in a second, um, in RC1, which is that uh, apparently for some people, they couldn't get past the, tr uh, the new anonymous usage tracking plug in first time setup wizard. So when you install 1.3.10 for the first time, you get this wizard that asks you if, you, if it's allowed to track, um, if it's allowed to track or not, uh, uh, or not, and um, you have to decide this then, because otherwise most people will probably do what a lot of people usually do when they are prompted with plugins that they can just quickly click through, is that they will quickly cl quickly click through, and this is the reason why this uh, wizard is mandatory. And for some people, this wizard cannot be completed, completed, so they they can click whatever, allow it or not allow it, and nothing happens and um, I so far haven't figured out why that is, because the people who reported this issue so far, apart from one person, uh, simply just uh, didn't even try to uh, yeah, provide me with the information I need in order to analyze, this, anal analyze it and hopefully debug it, but just, yeah, basically just went, it doesn't work, it's shit, and went away again. So this is not really helpful, and um, yeah, um, this is also something that brings me to a bit of a rant that I need to get off my chest today. Um, there's one thing that I really noticed with this re re recent uh, release candidate for 1.3.10 1 is that I have the feeling that a lot of people who are now running RCs are not people who are fully aware that a release candidate is not a stable version. Um, I do not provide a release candidates in order to give you access to features or bug fixes or something like that earlier than uh, in a stable version, but rather to figure out what bugs still exist in the release candidate and what bugs I still need to fix because, yeah, I cannot test against every possible hardware under the sun. Um, I cannot replicate every possible environment that uh, Octoprint might be running on uh, in, in your homes, and I can also not replicate every single plugin combination that might be possible out there. So this is where basically beta testers come in and uh, people who yeah look into look at install an RC, take a look at how it works out for them and report back with all information needed in order to track down any bugs that they run into. Um, and that basically means that if you run a release candidate, you should really be prepared that something might break and might break in a way that makes it necessary for you to actually yeah, roll back not only to an earlier version, but roll back to an earlier version via the command line because something might break in a way that it is not possible to do so via the user interface anymore. And if you're not comfortable with that, and I also wrote this in the yeah in the general how to install a release candidate uh, FAQ entry. If you do not feel comfortable doing that, then you really should not be running a release candidate. And um, and I had the feeling that some of the people who yeah basically got a bit insulting as a result of running into bugs with release candidates were definitely not comfortable with this possible situation. And if you run into a, uh, a bug in a release candidate, it is, is, it is absolutely crucial that you not just say XYZ stopped working and then go away again, but instead open a full bug report, you know, like with logs, with steps to reproduce, with uh, screenshots, with as, as, as much information as humanly possible um, to replicate the bug that you ran into, because the the thing is, if you ran into this bug, it's 
very, very possible that you ran into this bug, not be because I did not test my software, because I always test my software, but rather because you used the software in a way that I did not think of. And that means that I need help in order to figure out how you used my software. And um, yeah, in order to, to be able to figure out why it broke in that specific scenario. And uh, yeah, for that, I mean, need, I mean, uh, I need a lot of information. And um, what also might be possible is that after you provide me with blocks and after you provide me with uh, steps to reproduce and I that I come back to you with additional questions like I cannot reproduce this here, but I have an idea what happens when you click this button and what happens when you try this config setting uh, stuff like that. So I, I really need some dialogue here. I need some collaborate collaborative dialogue. And um, yeah, and, and this is something that is really important. If you run release candidates, you need to be prepared to do all that because otherwise it doesn't make sense for you to run a release candidate. Um, or rather, it doesn't make sense for everyone else that you run a release candidate. The whole point is uh, to figure out bugs, to figure out issues that arise. And in order to solve these issues, we, I need to know about them. And if you don't tell me about them, then I cannot fix them. And this is uh, basically the whole point. And in any case, I mean, people who are watching this right now and also probably people who are watching this as a recording are not people who fall into this category. But in general, when communicating with someone over the Internet, remember, there's a person sitting on the other end. Yeah, so much for the insulting and, and such. I just needed to get this off my chest, really. Yeah. Um, something else that I found very interesting is um, with 1.3.10, I released this anonymous usage tracking uh, for the first time that I mentioned. So this, this new bundle plugin that you have opt-in for um, in order to report back some usage data to me, uh, or rather to tracking.octoprint.org, um, which contains information about what version of Octoprint you are running, uh, how long your print jobs are running, what firmware you are running, stuff like that. And um, yeah, I saw that... Uh, um, that uh, that there are like now I I think something like over 900 instances running the release candidates, and when I compare that with the feedback that I got, the amount of people who actually report back like okay it works or I have an issue or something like that is like no, right so um, this is okay if if you really don't have any issues and all that I now see that you are running this version and then I can just think okay. No problem, apparently for 900 people or for 880 people, um, all well in that case. Um, but uh, really, if you have problems, you need to report them in that case, because otherwise I really don't know if there are problems or not. Right. So, um, and uh, considering that I now finally, for the first time ever in the life of Octoprint, I have some uh, actual uh, data, I thought it might maybe be interesting for you to take a look at what I'm seeing now based on um, this uh, new tracking plugin. So I thought I'd just give you a quick sneak peek into the um, dashboard that I built. Um, initially, I had set up Kibana for all this, which is part of the Elk stack, so Elasticsearch, Logstash and Kibana. But uh, I recently started playing around with Grafana uh, for my um, yeah, for my home automation, basically, and found it, yeah, found it somewhat more nicer to use. So I've now set everything up in Grafana and I thought I'd just uh, show you how things are looking or what kind of information I'm even seeing so that you have a better grip of that. So I'm switching you over here to this screen and I'm trying to make this a bit bigger. Okay. Um, so basically what I can see is how many instances are there over time. These are hourly stats. So uh, I see that currently the number of uh, people newly installing their C is apparently still growing. I see that there are 910 instances at, um, who I have seen over the whole time ever. Um, I see how many instances I saw that were running 1.3.10 RC1, uh, 1.3.10 RC2. 
and all the other versions, um, those do not add up to that number because those can also contain duplicates. So these 466 people here who uh, or instances here uh, that are now running RC2 might also be counted up here um, uh, for RC1. So I still need to um, get a bit more familiar with elastic search queries in order to uh, make this something that really only shows the last version that was installed on an instance, but I figure that out. Um, yeah, I also get something like a sum of uh, total hours uh, or total time printed here. And it's actually now uh, such a large number that it's cutting off the seconds here. Um, so these are 11,600 hours and I have a more uh, granular breakdown of all that by version as well. So I see, okay, apparently RC2 is working because people have already printed something like 2.574K hours with it. Um, and that's a, a fairly, a fairly helpful information. Um, total instances across the world plotted on a map based on a geohash grid. So if I zoom in a, a bit there, you, uh, you will see that it's like, yeah, like dots really on a grid. I have no idea who over there in Germany is running 92 instances or how many people are actually there that whose instances accumulate to this number in this specific uh, geogrid location, but it's rather quite interesting. And this gives me a, a bit of an idea about the geographic distribution, but not, uh, I'm, I'm not able to figure out where you live or something like that, because it's basically, it, this works via uh, yeah, GeoIP lookup. So basically using the IP um, that you connect to the tracking server or your Octoprint instance connects to the tracking server with, with, I can get a rough idea where approximately on the globe that is. And this is basically reflected there. Yeah. I also have something like how many instances were seen per hour per day, what Python versions they're running, pip versions, Raspberry Pi model, if running on a Raspberry Pi, Octopi version, if running Octopi, uh, print success versus failure rate, um, Prints over time, um, started, cancelled, done, errored, and unknown failure. Um, ignore that high number here for a bit because I only introduced the difference between cancelled and errored in uh, 1.3.10 RC2. So this is why this number goes down significantly here and the blue cancelled one goes up. Throttle events, so 1.3.10 uh, also um, now figures out if your Raspberry Pi is throttled for some reason and green is currently throttled and yellow is throttled uh, for some reason in the past. And I now also get some stats on that. Uh, total print duration over time, reported firmwares, only the top 20 so, though, because this list is endless long, which kind of, yeah, sums up why I'm struggling so much sometimes with, uh, with, with firmware, co firmware compatibility, because there is really a ton out of there. Um, then what day and what hour of the day prints are usually started. Basically you see, okay, a ton more on the weekend than during the week. Surprise, surprise. Um, and also recently added is uh, top 10 new plugin installs and general updates that are run of Octoprint and other components. Um, don't take this top 10 plugin install uh, graph here is something that means which is the most popular plugin. It on, only tells us um, how often this specific plugin was installed over the whole time frame that we are currently looking at. So the last 30 days, it does not tell us that there are only 71 instances out there running that, but that 72, uh, 71 times this plugin was installed over these, uh, this past month. So um, yeah. I currently have no way to figure out, uh, or rather the tracking plugin currently does not track the list of installed plugins because of the way how it works. This is very difficult to obtain. Um, and therefore this is currently the only thing that I have, but at least I have that. And um, I'm actually looking into making this dashboard or at least some static version of it available to public consumption in the future so that uh, people can actually take a look at these metrics all the time and know where the data is basically going and uh, get an idea of uh, everything. So for example, that there are uh, only around 
eight, yeah, only eight Raspberry Pi ones apparently out there. By the way, ignore that one. That is my test, <laughs> my my one single test instance, which reports itself as a Raspberry Pi Model F. So just ignore that. But um, yeah, gives a, a really nice, uh, it gives a, neat, a really nice uh, uh, base of data in the future, hopefully for me to determine in what direction I should take Octoprint also development wise um, in order to yeah best utilize what hardware people are running on and all that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very happy about these uh, info, information. Um, uh, yeah, information is not, there is no plural, right? Ah, my English is failing me again. So I'm very happy about finally having some data and I'm a bit scared actually what will happen to this number here when this all goes live with, with 1310 uh, stable. Um, I will currently see uh, two possible scenarios. I will be very, very disappointed or I will cower under my table and uh, yeah, be very scared how many people are using it. So I will see. But yeah, I thought this might be somewhat interesting. Um, okay, so with that being said, what are the next steps? So I already just have to switch something back here. So I already um, mentioned it that I fixed a couple of things in uh, 1310 RC2, which naturally means there will be a 1310 RC3. <laughs> And um, based on the current feedback, I really hope that that will be the last one that is necessary for 1310 before I can um, make it a stable release. But I'm not 100% sure yet because there's still a weekend uh, ahead. And usually um, after the weekend with a, with a fresh RC, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to figure out uh, where I stand. Because as we saw, most people print over the weekend. <laughs> um, and yeah, so uh, the verdict is still a bit out, but I'm having my hopes up. Okay, um, so if everything works out well, and I also t uh, figure out what is, is the current issue that I got reported just two hours or so ago with regards to some third party plugins, then I will hopefully be able to roll out uh, RC3 next week. Um, and then, yeah, just see how things look from there on. Um, and as I mentioned, I... I still have this problem with this uh, tracking plugin, so anonymous usage tracking plugin wizard that failed for some people who did not provide me with any information in order to debug this and I have not been able to reproduce this and neither has anyone else I've asked so far. Um, so if you have been able to reproduce this or even better, if you are still able to reproduce it, then please, 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 please get in touch with me, provide me with the log files, provide me with the JavaScript error console and ideally that would really be perfect. Give me some way to access this instance and poke around a bit in it myself and, and try to figure out what is up there. Yeah. Um, okay, so that much for 1.3.10. Um, also, uh, of course, 1.4.0 is also something that I still uh, work on uh, right now. There are quite a number of PRs, uh, pull requests now open. Uh, that mostly target Python 3 compatibility. And this is something that I really, really need to review <laughs> and um, merge and all that, and uh, which I so far haven't gotten around to thanks to everything else that was going on. And um, yeah, I really need to get around to, to, to get those reviewed and merged ASAP. So this is one of the top priorities <laughs> the next couple of weeks. Um, actually, the, the earlier the better. Um, and the same actually also goes for uh, one three eleven. So for the uh, so the so the next uh, maintenance release one three ten isn't even out of the door, and I'm already talking about one three eleven. Um, there is now at least one or even two uh, two I think two PRs that are supposed to go in there uh, ready to review, and I so far haven't found a time to actually review. And uh, obviously, I want to do that ASAP. So this is definitely also what I will do the second that I have my hands free for that, so to speak. All right. Um, yeah, and once all that tackled, then I take a look at uh, what to tackle next. Uh, probably, of course, one for all. But uh, yeah, um, these days it's, it's really not, it's a really crazy, it, it's, it's a little bit crazy uh, with with the maintenance uh, that, that that is necessary, rather not the maintenance. So it's not really bug fixing that's eating a ton of time, but rather 
report, uh, responding to bug reports and then figuring out if they are even bugs and all that or something like this. So I'm not completely sure yet why things feel so crazy and why I feel like all I do these days again is maintenance, but I'm looking into it and I'm trying to observe what exactly is happening here and uh, figure it out and uh, find a solution for it so that I can get back to more development work again because I really miss this. Yeah. Um, okay. And with this, I think we can switch over again to the other screen. Uh, let me, because I have, of course, have prepared some slides again with the questions that are uh, going to be tackled now during the Q&A segment. There we are. Um, because I don't want to have to, uh, don't want you to have to uh, try to follow these questions uh, when I'm just reading them. It's easier, I think, for everyone if they are on the screen. All right, so um, the first question is actually by Tedda. And it's, uh, what have you printed lately? We always see your software work, but not your print work. Yeah, so funny problem, actually. <laughs> Uh, I rarely get around to printing these days. I mean, of course, I do a lot of prints, but, but those are these small, little, boring calibration pieces or benches or whatnot. So nothing serious, nothing fancy, nothing cool. Or, or stuff like, like this to just quickly test something and then have a place to stick my uh, note notes uh, in and, and things like that. But nothing cool, fancy, uh, nerdy or something like that. Um, but, uh, thankfully I still sometimes get around to doing that. Um, and so I just figured I, I'd show you some pictures, what I actually did, what would qualify as recently. So one thing I did was I, I solved a personal problem of mine, which is that I designed a little shelf for my anchor sound called sound core Bluetooth speakers. Um, so to, to hook this shelf over the door of my shower and be able to listen to music while showering. So this then sits over the shower on the inside of the shower. Those things are waterproof, which is why I dare to do this. And this is really nice for me in the mornings because uh, it really helps me uh, wake up. Um, yeah. And uh, another thing that I printed, which was actually something that I wanted to print for five years now and always forgot to do in time for Halloween was this cute little pumpkin thingy. Uh, thing number 172135 um, on um with a little battery operated tea light in it. And this time I managed to get around to print it before Halloween, at least a couple of days before Halloween. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it really, it really was a, a nice little thing to have on my uh, couch table and uh, enjoy in the in the evenings. Yeah. Um, also, there are probably some print projects on the horizon. As I mentioned, I'm currently looking into home automation again with Home Assistant. And I just built myself or started building myself a couple of sensors to put, put around the house and mostly to monitor humidity, uh, temperature and pressure. And also to uh, throw in the one or other um, here, uh, motion sensor and Bluetooth uh, LE uh, presence detection. And um, I'm going to need enclosures for those. <laughs> so I'm either going to, to look what I can find, which is already modeled or, or which is more likely I'll, I'll model something myself and um, do that. And uh, also part of the home automation stuff is that I bought myself a new Hue bridge and I want to mount it under my desk, but I don't have a mount yet that fits, so I'm going to need to do that as well. So I'm going to print things. It's just going to take a while as usual, probably, but hopefully not five years like the, like the pumpkin. Yeah. Um, next question, also by Tedda. Uh, do you have a Prusa MMU2 or one on order? Uh, neither. <laughs> Um, the tech of that thing is actually something that interests me, but uh, I'm not a big fan of pre-orders in general of hardware. <laughs> I've been burned a bit in the past with things like this, not with Prusa, but in general. And um, considering how little time I find to actually print things, as we just heard, um, 
I uh, yeah currently just don't feel like it would be a good investment of my 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 money. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'll, I'll leave the playing around with this uh, a bit a bit more to other people, and then maybe that somewhere down the road when I suddenly have this urging need to print multicolors or something like that, then I might uh, change this. But currently, nothing like this planned for me. Yeah. Okay, and. Ah, where's my mouse cursor? There. And uh, this brings us to the next question from John. Uh, the 3D printing community has very deep links to makerspaces and fab labs. Are you part of a makerspace or fab lab near you? How would you respond if you were invited to give a talk and or workshop about Octoprint plugins? So first of all, I'm not affiliated with any hackerspace or fab lab here um, or makerspace. Uh, there is one in Frankfurt, I think in Rödelheim, but I'm not entirely sure if they are still there or have moved or if that was where they moved. I only um, observed this movement stuff uh, uh, um, yeah, from afar uh, on Twitter. Um, I thought a couple of times about visiting, visiting them, but so far I haven't even managed to do that because everything else is constantly going on and I just never managed so far. Um, to the second part of the question, actually, I would be thrilled. So um, if I somehow would be able to <laughs> get there to whatever maker, make, makerspace or fab lab we are talking to, I would actually be very, very uh, yeah, enthusiastic about uh, teaching people how to code plugins or whatever, or use the, the REST API or something like this. Um, so far, no one has asked, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I would probably respond very enthusiastically. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I should have gotten myself a cup of water, I think. Ah, well, too late now for that. Um, anyway, um, next question would be uh, also by John. I've heard some angry grumblings from a couple of Redeem Replicate developers. The G-code is a less than ideal way to send commands to a printer. I tend to disagree, but I was wondering what you think of the G-code language in general. So this is a bit of one of my favorite hate topics, actually. Um, first of all, it's very important that we differ here between uh, G-code as a file format, which it actually is supposed to be, uh, and its abused form as a protocol in 3D printing. So G-code per se, comes from, from the word of CNC. It's a NIST standard, so it's completely well documented in, I don't know what, what thick of a document, uh, which explains what every command is supposed to do, how commands are structured, what kind of parameters they take and all that, and what they do when they get what parameters, and so very, very well defined. And on the other side, we have this tinker together mess that is G-code for communicating with 3D printers, which is something that was cobbled together over the past couple of years and is, uh, yeah, really not the best thing that I've ever seen in my life. So um, it's fairly bloated, which basically comes from the point that it is a plain text protocol and um, a binary rep representation of all these commands and all that, that you need to send as fast as possible over a serial line. Um, yeah, would probably be not only yeah faster, but also be easier to parse. Um, it's not well defined at all what we have there, um, apart from some uh, yeah apart from a, from a page on the rep rep wiki that uh, basically everyone uh, and their mother can edit. Um, there is not nothing really in terms of a spec and. Um, nothing that, that nails down the requests and responses in this communication protocol. And so there's nothing that firmware developers can refer to in order to be sure that their implementation is correct, because we basically do not really have a definition of correct. And uh, that also makes it exceptionally difficult for a host developer, because while this wiki page documents how, for example, you query the, language, uh, query the temperature, it's not documented how the response that you get back is supposed to look like. So um, the temperature query is actually one of my uh, one, of, one of the very best examples for this problem because uh, there are so many variants by now how how firmware uh, report back the hot end versus the target uh, actually versus the target temperature. Um, 
then there are sometimes things encoded that include uh, the the current um, yeah the current power level sent to the heater. Sometimes it, there aren't. Some uh, some firmwares enumerate the the if there are multiple extruders enumerate them starting with T zero, then T one, T two, T three. Others have T, T1, T2, T3, others have only T1, T2, T3. So it's complete, completely all over the place and really difficult to write a parser that understands everything and without being able to query the firmware what kind of format it puts out. Because there is no way to query the firmware what kind of format it put out, puts out. So yeah, so this is something of a mess really. And uh, before you say, oh, Gina, why are you only complaining about uh, things just, just take measures to make it better. I tried. I got met with some heavy resistance from the community when I tried to nail down a standard for our G-code communication or rather for our communication with the printers. And I'm honestly not too, uh, too keen on repeating this experience. So uh, because it got a bit personal in places. So uh, yeah. At this point, I think I'm qualified to just say the situation as it is now is is bad and I try to fix it, but people wouldn't let me, so I'm allowed to complain. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and as I already said, the problem was also that this whole G-code based communication protocol thingy, it's, it's very, very fragmented. So because there is no standard that tells firmware developers and host developers how things are supposed to look like, um, firmware developers often yeah inter interpret interpret whatever they find differently so um or they add some bits here and there and then suddenly everything behaves completely different so you have some firmware that demands line numbers and checksums on every command. You have some some that don't. You have some firmware that claims it does one but then in fact does the other and yeah, it's it's just everything is just all over the place, and the only way to figure it out is either to get access to some some printer running set firmware, and oftentimes they're also a uh, closed source, so this is actually the only way to look at the firmware, poke at it from every side, and then try to reverse engineer what it actually does and how it actually is behaving, and this is tricky to say the least. Yeah. So in general, when it comes to using G code to uh, communicate with 3D printers, I would definitely. Yeah, grumble along with the other developers who are grumbling. Um, it definitely is more of a tinkered together kind of protocol than something that someone sat down, thought through and defined properly. So, yeah, um, I guess if I had to design something like this from ground up, I'd probably go for, first of all, of course, a separate communication protocol in file format. Um, I'd also use a binary protocol uh, with some built-in message integrity checking for both directions because right now uh, the printer can check if what it got from the host is correct but the host has no way to check if what if it what got from the printer is actually correct which can lead to stuff like instead of the the host getting getting an okay back from the firmware it gets mangled somewhere on the way and the host only gets a k or an o or an or bloop and uh, the communication stalls and there's no way to figure out, oh, there was a communication error from the firmware to the host and I need to re-request this response or something like this. So, yeah, dual, uh, um, uh, dual um, back and forth integrity checking, definitely. I would probably also want something like separate command control and data channel because right now you have this issue that when the printer is busy printing it's really hard to to shoe in some shoehorn in some kind of command like stop printing thank you um and yeah and also i would probably really really want some kind of not only well-defined written down documentation but also a, a, a usable test tool that uh, both host and firmware developers could just shoot their software against and then figure out if they are compliant or not. So this would be my approach, but, and now I have to cut. I'm really sorry. <coughs> <coughs> oh yeah, this is fun. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers this question. I'm definitely in the, in the grumbling crowd, I guess. 
Um, next question by uh, Jubaleth is, uh, do you feel that the latest drive to educate and protect users from themselves with regards to Octoprint instances being opened up to the public internet has been or will be effective? Um, so first of all, maybe a bit of background for those of you who haven't watched the past um, episode or who have already forgotten what I mentioned in there. Um, um, so there, there was this in, in early September, I think, or late August, something like that. Uh, the ISC Internet Storm Center put out a blog post about having found something like 3000 Octoprint instances, more or less well secured, uh, publicly reachable on the internet. And um, after that, we actually Jubilith wrote this uh, guest blog post that we put, pushed uh, out via the blog, uh, via the Octoblog, and uh, which showed people hopefully some possible ways to remotely access the Octoprint instance, instance without having to put up a port forward, um, which putting up a port forward is actually something that I have ever since I uh, were, uh, started, ever since I created Octoprint, uh, repeatedly advised against doing because, well, basically you do not put your refrigerator on the internet and you do not put your radiator on the internet. So why would you put your 3D printer on the internet? Um, it's a physical device in your home and you do not want to give everyone with an internet connection potentially access to that. And the moment you open up a port to it, you give everyone with an internet ex uh, uh, connection potentially access to it. Um, still, uh, I decided to try some new things in 1.3.10 in order to further educate people and basically shove this information into their faces a bit more prominently. And um, one of these is uh, a little notification that will now pop up in 1.3.10 that um, if you log in from an, a non-local client IP, so basically if you have a port forward, hmm, um, and uh, yeah, that will contain a link to this blog post and also tell you that what you're doing right there is not a good idea. Um, and also have a little, a little ignore button in case you are of a different opinion and don't want to get this notification all the time. Um, what I also added is this new bundled force lock, force lock in plug in. Ooh, this is a tricky word to say. Try this 10 times in a row. Um, that uh, removes this read only access for anonymous guests that Octoprint have, has been sporting ever since so far. Um, where if you're not logged in, you can still see what your printer is printing, how the progress is and all that. And um, yeah, this force lock in plugin now basically removes this kind of access and forces you to log in because before you can see anything or get any kind of information on the API or on the push socket. What it cannot do is also something that I mentioned last time. Um, it cannot prevent access to the webcam because Octoprint does not control the webcam. It merely embeds it. So it cannot uh, keep you from yeah, keep someone from just circumventing Octoprint altogether and going directly to the webcam if you have port forwarded that. But um, it can at least protect your APIs and all that so that no one can download your printed files or see what you're currently printing or how the file is named that you're currently printing and all that. And I also added some more warnings about not exposing uh, your Octoprint instance on the public internet to the first run wizard. Okay. So with all that being done and that blog post and this constant and constant and constant, constant reiteration of not recommending to, to port forward and all that, I honestly do not think that this will change anything, <laughs> which is a bit sad, really. So um, based on my experience of the past years of maintaining this piece of software, people really do not like to read uh, or, or, or follow or listen, at least listen to advice and are also inherently lazy, um, which means that a port forward is probably still something like the easiest thing to do for most people because uh, effort, you know. Um, but what I have hopes for is that um, all these new things, first of all, uh, mostly the, the notification and the, the uh, set, uh, first time setup wizard warnings, uh, that those will reach some people who yeah, really just didn't think about it yet, you know, like that people that are that that just never, never, never thought about what it might mean to open something like this up as a port uh, with a port forward and which not which uh, who, who, who did not do it out of, yeah, out of convenience, but rather out of a lack of knowledge of possible alternatives. So I think for those 
it might work um, for those who are yeah always knowing everything better and uh, refusing to accept advice it won't but for them at least the false lock in plugin will hopefully prevent um, yeah some snooping or getting snooped out but yeah I mean it's basically it's it's a fight against windmills through as though uh, oh and um, yeah sometimes also quite frustrating but I I can't prevent people from opening up Octoprint to the internet. It's simply not something that is technical possible, or at least it's not something that's technical possible without crippling the software severely, which I'm not uh, going to do. Um, so I just hope that it might reach some people. Uh, what I actually expect, what will happen when a 1.3.10 goes live with this new notification is that I probably will get some infuriated ticket tickets opened on GitHub again, like, I don't want this, and oh, stupid notification and all that. Um, uh, yeah, because in, in the past, it was sadly my experience with new features that I added in order to keep uh, yeah people who are not completely technically... Um, inclined from shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, yeah, usually got this kind of feedback. So um, I'm expecting this kind of feedback again, but still I'm, I'm not going to budge there. The, the notification can be ignored if, you're, if you think you don't need this kind of information. Like actually there's an ignore button which will set a cookie in your browser so that you will not get it shown again. So yeah, this is going to stay. Um, it's actually something that I also experienced with the printer safety plugin. I've had some people get angry about this message popping up for their printer and not as a false positive, but actually with reason popping up for the printer, which then uh, got a bit angry and uh, demanded to uh, immediately tell them how to remove this stupid message and all that. And the funny thing is that the message actually tells you to consult the FAQ entry, which tells you how to, re how to remove the stupid message. But well, okay. Uh, see about people don't read <laughs> yeah so um, just to maybe summarize all this I'm going to keep trying to improve things in this way but it's sometimes a really 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 unthankful job <laughs> so well I guess I just have to live with this knowledge that a lot of people will still ignore good advice even if it's shoved into their face and blinking in the meantime oh well okay and the final question in the backlog, uh, why does the UI need to, re by MacMaster P, sorry. Why does the UI need to reload after I click download of an uploaded G-code file? So it usually doesn't, um, if it does, even in safe mode. So when you're absolutely sure it cannot be one of your installed third party plugins, then please open a bug report because this is stuff that needs a bug report in order to get fixed. And this is definitely not something that it should be doing. Um, yeah. And in general, I would suggest if you have questions like these, don't wait for the next Octoprint on Air episode to go live and get them answered in the Q&A section, but rather open a bug report <laughs> um, or at least uh, get in touch on the on the uh, yeah on the Octoprint community forums because, well, I, I think usually you will get an answer faster that way, right? How oh, well? Okay. So this was all, sorry, this was all uh, from the, um, yeah, from the question backlog that I uh, wanted to tackle here today. Now I'm just quickly taking a look at the live chat if there's anything. Uh, if you have any questions, you might want to ask, ask them now. And apparently there are currently no questions, or at least there were so far none. I'll give it a couple more seconds and just start with the wrap up. Ah, right, there is something. Do you plan to give access to at least a subset of the nice graphs you showed us previously? Yeah, as I mentioned, I hope to be able to achieve that. What I do not want to do is give people public access to the actual, uh, yeah, to this actual Grafana instance, because I simply do not want to risk any of this data uh, getting in the hands of the wrong people or rather any of the source data getting in the hands of the wrong people. It's a privacy concern basically, but I'm looking into exporting regular snapshots or something like that and making them uh, available for public consumption because then you just have, yeah, 
basically the, the resulting data, so what is in the graphs, um, but not the underlying data from which these results are calculated. And yeah, this is something that I would be feeling way, way more comfortable with, especially in light of uh, GDPR. <clears throat> Such a joy. Yeah. Um, I hope this answers the question. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm still looking into how and with the maintenance release and all that. Um, I can't promise you that I will be able to do that right next week or in the next two weeks, but I'm really, really looking into getting this out as soon as possible. Also because it, uh, yeah, it, um, it feels like the right thing to do. And I'm also actually switching back to the webcam here because you don't need to see the questions anymore that we have already tackled. Um, oh, and there is something that is held for review. So, uh, David asks, do you know how new multi-material products like Pellet from Mosaic will work with Octoprint? Um, I have no idea actually, um, because I don't have access to a Pellet. As far as I understand it, it's basically just, uh, yeah, into, yeah, getting the, getting a G code in, in some, yeah, with some special command sets or something like that where the splicing is supposed to happen and then it executes that and streams the stuff to the printer which is actually something that i wonder how well it works with the various firmwares that do not adhere to anything but yeah well um my guess would be that it will probably work in some way but no idea how exactly and yeah if someone gets me a pellet i can test <laughs> but other than that no idea um, and Ivan asks uh, something like an individual graph. Yeah, well, actually, I would like to get the whole dashboard um, um, accessible to everyone or by everyone accessible to every this, this sentence doesn't make sense, but I hope you are able to still parse it in some way. Um, uh, just um, exporting something like individual graphs or individual in, individual uh, renditions of the graphs is actually fairly easy with Grafana because it even has an API for that. So I could just have some cron job running on some other instance, uh, on some other server, and just pick all these graphs together and um, and then build up a, a, yeah, a static dashboard from that. But I would actually prefer to be able to um, use uh, or to export a full dashboard, a full interactive dashboard, because let me quickly switch back there. Um, because it actually allows you something like these mouse over effects and in the in the map, you can also zoom in and uh, things like this. And this is actually, I think, far more usable than if you just see this static image. I mean, this is still nice, but with some Interactivity is actually nicer and you can, I think, even on the snapshot data, you could also do something like this. And this is actually helpful, I think, if someone wants to dig down a bit deeper for some reason or another. So, yeah, I I think if I'm getting this data, it would be nice if you would get the same data and the same possibilities to play around with the data. So basically, that would be the idea here. 30 days. <clears throat> oh, look, 912 instance now. instances now earlier. I think it was four less. Um, yep. Okay, so uh, still any more questions right now? Not so. Let's wrap this up, I think, before my voice goes the way of the dodo. Um, yeah, so uh, as usual, the next um, episode or the next broadcast will be in roughly a month, plus minus, uh, rather plus. <laughs> um, a couple of weekends, I have to see when I have time. Uh, I usually try to do this on a Saturday, uh, on, on a Saturday, so that more people can attend. Uh, doing it this Friday is actually an exception because my Saturdays are simply, uh, yeah, were simply taken already, and I didn't want to have you uh, wait even longer for the next broadcast. So I, so I thought rather <laughs> do it on a Friday than and do than not do it at all this week. So yeah, um, I will post the appointment on Patreon as always. And uh, I will also try to get this recording of that one here um, released sometime next week uh, when I find the time to cut it and also uh, create the uh, the yeah the index basically with the jump marks for the uh, sections and all that. 
Yeah. And with that being said, I think we are through. Um, yeah. So thanks for being here. And if you're watching this as a recording, thanks for watching. <laughs> and uh, I hope it was interesting. And um, I also hope I see you the next time. And until then, I guess all I can say is uh, happy printing. Bye.